The house burned in front of them. And they needed the data to prove it. The audacity and the ridiculousness of the obvious. Convincing them that they needed a business case. If the smoke doesn't alarm you, then the fire most certainly should. Let that vibrate for a moment. The house burned before them. And they needed the data to prove it. The audacity and the ridiculousness of the business case convincing them of the obvious. If the smoke doesn't alarm you, then most certainly the fire should. Bernard Coleman, chief diversity officer for Uber, said that in an article in January of this year. The reason I start with that is because it is incredibly important that we stop relying on an excuse of needing a business case. There's not enough talent in the pipeline. It's incredibly important that there's a room full of recruiters and HR people, folks that do branding, that we start to recognize and understand that we have a responsibility to be that recruiting innovator that you just mentioned. Maybe I speak a little bit better, clearer American, but I'm not any better than you. It's important for us to understand that we have a responsibility if we're really going to do DNI. So since 2012, heck, 2005, 2000, we've been talking about the business case. We've got recruiters in this game that don't seem to necessarily understand how to infuse recruiting of diverse, underrepresented talent in their process. I got leaders that have role clarity. They have process understanding and still shrug their shoulders around doing a better job of DNI. I got leaders who put a pretty message on their website and allocate zero resources and time to the effort. I'm tired. And so should you. You should be tired. I got women in the room. You got me too and time's up rocking. You got a responsibility to make this thing differently. You should be tired. But tired doesn't mean that we give up. Tired just means that we work a little bit harder, a little bit smarter. So when they invite me to speak, we tell the truth, because I love people. It's the only reason why I do this work, because I love people. And so what I did was I curated a group of an incredible individuals who you will hear from. I got a couple of them. But before we get to them, if I don't mess up this computer, I don't see a clicker, I don't see an enter. So we just want actionable, authentic results built into the process, real simple. I ain't really big on slides. But I am trying to change the results. See, what I try to tell people when we work in these uh, organizations is that there's no fairy dust. Doing DNI or diversity, equity, and inclusion requires you to do some work. Same type of work that you do recruiting everyone else in your organization. I just need you to do some work. You got to be willing to do the work. We got too many people not willing to do the work. And we are responsible for that. We got to change the narrative and the effort that's put into this. And so for me, I want people that can negotiate with purpose and power. I need you to have your voice. So when you go inside and you speak to your executive, about getting allocation of resources to support your effort. I want you to have a voice. When you go inside your executives and they want the data for that burning house, is that really important? We know that better teams do a better job. Diverse team, McKenzie, Deloitte, everyone has done the studies. So we don't need more studies around the power of diversity. We just simply need you to do the work. That's it. Like the room should be overflowing with individuals because you are serious about doing this work. Fair enough? So 
the first person that's going to come up. She wrote an incredible article. My favorite quote is mine. <laughs> mine. First person coming up, Ms. Bari A. Williams. She wrote an incredible article on race, AI, and data, and really why it's important for us to not minimize race in the conversation. It can get lost when we have such powerful hashtags like Me Too and Time's Up and so many other things. It can get lost when we start to look at building our engineering teams and they are homogenous and look exactly the same. Race can be pushed to the back burner. But like Bari and myself, we're not allowing that to happen. Ms. Williams. I like to make things a little bit interactive. So can somebody tell me what are some defining characteristics of diversity for you? Just somebody shout one out. Different perspectives. Cognitive diversity? Okay. I'm going to tell you why I personally have an issue with cognitive diversity. <laughs> um, but we can, we can, class, okay, class is another one. Anybody got others? Gender? Educate, yes, that's a good one that people often, yes, there we go. That is one that particularly in my industry, I work in tech, that people ignore the most. I am 38 years old. I am a black woman. People should just put me out to pasture, is typically what people tend to think. But cognitive diversity was the thing, the first thing that you said. And that's actually another piece that I wrote in the New York Times in October when Denise Young-Smith wrote or was on a panel talking about how 12 white men in a room could essentially be diversity. No problem solved, right? except not really because why do you have a job? So if 12 white men in a room are diverse, what are the different factors that could make up that type of diversity? Discipline? Yes. Age? Ability? Sexuality? Political perspective? Class? All of those things. However, one thing which Torin was hitting on is that people are essentially ignoring the fact that cognitive diversity is typically born out of representational diversity. And so that means that you need women at the table. That means that you need people of color at the table. That means that you need people that are like me and like a lot of other, other people in this room who meet at the crossroads. And that's another piece that's often missing is intersectionality. So you see me and you either choose whether I am black or I am a woman. Now, the way that I personally identify find myself as I'm black first and then a woman, which is something else I try to get people to think about, is how do you present and how do you identify when you come into a room? When you wear multiple identities, which one is your primary identity? And for some, it could be as simple as where are you from? But to Torrance's point, the business case for diversity has already been made. We already understand. You named all the studies. We understand all of the stats. 1.3 trillion in, in black buying power, 1.25 trillion in Latinx buying power, we understand who trendsetters are in American culture, and American culture drives global culture. So to ignore those things would be at our own peril. So what I would implore people to do is to really pay very good attention to where you are lacking diversity, and typically they're in pockets of your organization. It's not enough to just say, well, we have 50% diversity rates in our company, but where? Where are those rates coming from? Are they all on the marketing team? Are they all in HR? You really reap the benefits of diversity on the individual team level. So it's not enough to just have diversity, whatever that means to you, in your company in one particular silo. It needs to be throughout. So your favorite quote was your own, my favorite quote is my own. <laughs> I would say diversity gets people in the room, but inclusion keeps them there. And I like to be very clear that diversity to me, and it could mean whatever it is that you choose for it to mean, diversity is bean counting. It's I have two women, I have two Latinx folks, I have one differently abled individual, I have one LGBTQ individual. And that to me is not enough, because you want to make sure that you're not just inviting people to the party, but you're asking them. The Blue Ocean Shift, they talk about raising, they talk about editing, they talk about erasing,
and even creating new processes and things that will allow you to be effective. Raising, editing, erasing, or creating. One person that I know does an incredible job of creating, Mr. Sam Sipa. And so when I met Sam a few weeks ago, January of this year, totally impressed me, moved me, not moved me, but moved me. And I had to do everything that I could to make sure that he was involved and included in the conversation. And so what I want is for you to experience what I experienced in January when I was in San Francisco last. This is Sam Sipa. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, San Francisco and all the visitors to the city. My name is Sam Sipa. I work at Google. I'm a program manager. My basic job at Google is to fix the broken recruiting process. <laughs> Pretty simple. OK, so for me, I'm not going to use a lot of slides. I actually, I'm not going to use any slides. I just want to share a story about how I got to where I am today and how I got to be the successful HR professional I am today. It wasn't just because I worked hard. It was also because I had amazing people who helped give me a chance to thrive. So when I was in college, I decided not to pursue becoming a history teacher and decided instead that I was going to pursue the HR field. That was my intention. But the biggest challenge in this field is communication. My deafness is a big concern for me. And as I neared graduation from college, I decided to just go ahead and pursue the HR field regardless of my deafness and, and chose to not make that a barrier to my success. So one day I saw a great job posting uh, it was on a disability-related website, and it was for an HR internship. I thought, perfect. So I applied to it, applied for it right away, and almost immediately, one recruiter, her name is Maureen, she reached out to me and said, hey, Sam, uh, you know, we had a chat over the phone. <clears throat> I said, you know, I'm deaf. I use a sign language interpreter. You're communicating with me over the phone through an interpreter. She said, that's fine. She looked at my resume and said, wow, you're uh, really well qualified for this. You've got, uh, you know, strong qualifications for this. Uh, you could do an internship at our office, which was at uh, Osram Sylvania, which is a Siemens company. So I thought, you know, great company, great opportunity. And, uh, but within a few days, uh, I found out the position had been closed, and I didn't get it. Well, no hard feelings. I was going to move on with my life. Other interps would come along. But Maureen said to me, Sam, keep in touch with me. And I thought, oh, this is just another one of she things she says after closing somebody. But she didn't close the door on me. A few weeks later, uh, another HR, HR position internship opened in one of her field offices at Siemens, and she called me, emailed me, and said, Sam, you know, this looks good for you, apply again. And I thought, all right. So I applied. A few weeks later, found out the position had been filled by someone else. They didn't hire me. I thought, all right, I'm going to just move on. But I started to have some mixed feelings about this. I thought, why am I getting all these rejections? I guess that's normal, right? Is this the typical experience? Perhaps it is. Maybe not. So I thought, hmm, maybe my being deaf is a barrier here. So Maureen kept in touch with me. She said, Sam, let's keep in touch with each other. Um, I think you really do have potential here. I think you should keep going. So I kept my chin up. I kept my pride and kept my search going for an HR internship. Then maybe a few months later, Maureen emails me and says, hey, Sam, I've got another HR position open, and this time it's in my office. This was in Boston. So I thought, well, seriously, am I going to try for this again? And I thought, well, what do I have to lose? So I applied, and this time I got invited for an interview. And I got it. So I guess third time's a charm. Well, it was an amazing experience for me because Maureen 
she wasn't just an advocate in me getting the role, but she ended up becoming the most amazing mentor I've ever had. And, she, and, not, and she's a great advocate, not only for people with disabilities, but she's representing that to senior leaders all over the industry, people who make decisions. And she was the one who gave me the power to really grow in this six month internship position. And so ever since then, you know, my career has just thrived. And I've had over 30 different mentors over the course of my HR career now. So because someone believed in me, someone advocated for me, someone wanted to invest in me. So my advice to you all as recruiters, as sourcers, those who are involved in the staffing community, when you see a highly qualified candidate, regardless of it, if they have a disability, if they're deaf, give everyone a chance to thrive. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because you're showing you care and when you show you care, I mean, looking back, look at the success I am today. Without you know, having Maureen there, I wouldn't have attained that. And through that, I learned how to network. I learned how to work with senior level people. And I work with them today at Google. And you know, I travel all over the world now, to Singapore, to London, you, know, you name it, Tokyo. I've been to a lot of different cities for work, and I know how to work with senior level people because the foundation that I was built that I, from my mentors who showed me how. So I just really want you to remember three important things today. One is when you see a diversity candidate get involved with their community. For example, the disability community, uh, the historically black colleges, go visit their campuses be in, seen in their community, be involved in their community. Don't just send an email from your desk. Second, be their employer of choice. Make sure that uh, maybe just mentor one hour a week, uh, it might be a lunch, uh, a way to introduce them to other peers, and that's the best way to really raise your uh, diversity workforce when you become their employer of choice. Third thing is pick one group at a time. A lot of companies are trying to reach out to so many diversity communities at once. Maureen just focused on people with disabilities. And after I left, she went on to mentor other people and work in other companies. But she was a dedicated advocate for people with disabilities. And she, to this day, still is and travels around the world um, to HR conferences, being an advocate for disability hiring and sharing best practices and her experiences and her expertise. So I was probably just one of the many interns that she mentored over the years, but uh, this is, her passionate area, this is what she's into. So I think one at a time makes a lot of sense and then you start building those connections and they start to become huge. It's just sort of like the Golden Gate Bridge. So there's a lot of people who helped raise a lot of amazing leaders. And they all have sort of a, one similar guiding principle whether you're young or old, black, white, straight, disabled, everyone has to have an equal chance to thrive. That's our valued principle in the US. So, thank you. Power of diversity. So we talked about race and keeping that in AI and data through Bari A. Williams. Appreciate you, Queen. Sam showed you the power of the advantage inside of diversity, and what he does each and every day over at Google. Appreciate you, King. This last individual is one of my favorite people on the planet because she's going to share with you how to rebuild your brand when you've gone through adversity. Miss Nzinga Shaw. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, I've got a very unique story as it relates to diversity and inclusion. 
I am the first chief diversity and inclusion officer for the Atlanta Hawks in Phillips Arena, but I'm also the first one in the National Basketball Association. Um, my job came about from a public crisis that we were facing, and it was pretty alarming at the time. And so I was on the crisis team at an agency named Edelman working on the account and ended up making a recommendation that they should really be fostering diversity and inclusion and, and have a long-term strategy where it's managed by an individual over time. And so I ended up leaving my job at Edelman to do this work because I truly believe not only in the firm, but I believe in the cause. And I think that the sports entertainment industry has a lot of opportunity to really be proactive in this space. The time At the time that we were going through our public racing crisis, the LA Clippers had just gotten out of theirs with Donald Sterling. And so I, I assume that this might have been a trend in the National Basketball Association and really just wanted to move this thing forward. So right now I operate by myself, but I have a group of people that work very closely with me to get this work done. And they're called my Diversity and Inclusion Council. And my council is very different from most councils that you'll see because uh, we are made up of both internal resources and external resources. So not only do we have Hawks employees on the council, but we've got voices from around the city of Atlanta, including academics, clergy, um, small business owners, ex-professional athletes, and the list goes on and on. So our council is broken up into three work streams and we, this is how we focus our work. We, we focus on internal engagement, which is all about the employee experience. So starting from the recruitment phase of finding new and unexpected talent, and then cultivating that talent once you get it in-house to make sure that everybody's able to reach their maximum potential. Our second work stream focuses on fan mm -hmm. engagement and external experience, which is all about what happens inside of Phillips Arena, whether it's at a basketball game, whether it's um, on a neighborhood basketball court or anywhere that we show up in the community, making sure that we have multiple voices and multiple experiences that are being brought forward so that anybody that attends our games can feel comfortable. So we've done organic outreach with the LGBTQ community. We've certainly taken a deep dive into the Hispanic community and the list goes on. We just really want to make sure that we're connecting with all of the different types of fans that um, we are currently engaging and, and even prospective fans that we'd love to engage in the future. Our last work stream is about strategic partnerships. And strategic partnerships is making sure that your organization is doing business beyond usual suspects. So the usual suspect in Atlanta would be a company like a Coca-Cola or a Chick-fil-A, big brands big organizations that are global in nature that are in this city. But we also want to make sure we're doing business with women-owned and minority-owned businesses. And I'm very proud to announce that recently we did a huge deal with H.J. Russell. H.J. Russell happens to be a minority-owned construction firm. And so they built the first ever sports medicine facility in the NBA for us about seven months ago in conjunction with Emory University. And so that's the, that's kind of what we mean when we say strategic partnerships, thinking beyond usual suspects. So I've been doing this work for three and a half years. We have a lot of uh, wins in new communities, really been engaging with um, different demographics that we haven't served and, and that the sports community hasn't served. And I definitely think that this is a job that will um, be implemented in the NBA beyond our team. Right now, uh, we have two other teams that are in search for chief diversity officers, and our commissioner has announced that he wants this job in uh, every single uh, basketball team over the next two years. So it's slow to move, but it's definitely moving in the right direction, and that's great. Thank you, Zynga. Sam, Bari. If you two would join me just for a second. So in Zing, I'm not sure if you can stay with us. If you can, awesome. If not, I do understand. I know you were working on an event. So as we close out this panel, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I want to make sure that we stay on task. So the good part about life right now is that if you are anywhere on social media and you enter in the hashtag Wakanda or on the run two, you are going to find a whole lot of people of color. One billion dollar movie, 
And Jay-Z and Beyonce just announced yesterday that the tickets go on sale for their concert tomorrow. So trust me when I tell you, if you get on Twitter and you enter in the hashtag Wakanda or On The Road 2, you are going to find a number of people of color that you can engage with in terms of conversation. My question to Bari first is something else that they can begin to do today because so many organizations struggle with how to get started. They want the right answer. They want a silver bullet, if you will, and there is no silver bullet. So what can they do today to get started? I think one thing that is very powerful that people often don't allow themselves to demonstrate is, is the sense of humility to say, I know what I don't know. And oftentimes people ask, well, where can I find candidates? Or I don't know where to, I don't know where to find people, so I keep going to the same places. But a lot of that could be solved if you simply raise your hand and say, I know what I don't know, and I don't know where to look. And then seek out someone who will help you, or, or just simply ask for help. And the first thing I would say, particularly if you're dealing in a diversity, a diversity focus, but you're in a tech industry, the first thing you should think about is it's a, it's a data-driven industry. So you should use the data to guide you. If you are looking for more women to put in your STEM programs, you probably shouldn't continue to look solely at UC Berkeley or Stanford. Look at women's colleges. If you're looking for, for students of color or black engineers to hire on your, your engineering team, go to North Carolina A&T, which graduates the biggest number of black engineers annually. Don't go to Stanford, don't go to MIT, go to North Carolina A&T. If you're looking for, for more women to put into certain business fields, why not look at Smith or Wellesley? You don't have to keep going to the same places. My grandmother always said to get something you don't have, you have to do something you haven't done. So Sam, when we talk about the power of diversity, there's an article uh, in the Harvard Business Review, June 2017, that talks about neurodiversity as a competitive advantage. And while you may not be a person to speak on neurodiversity, what I want is for you to think about the same question that Bari had. What can organizations do? Thinking about what Thibault said in terms of our being recruiting innovators, people needing to diversify their recruiting teams, what might you recommend they do so that they can take advantage of diversability? Hmm. Yeah, great question. Well, one thing uh, that Barry mentioned is, you know, knowing what you don't know. And, you know, that's where the true in innovation starts. Some people say, well, I'm not sure I'm what I'm supposed to do. Is this uh, exactly the best practice? I'm not sure if this is quite the right resource that I should use for recruiting. And, you know, that's, that's a barrier you can break by creating partnerships and starting to get innovative. Um, best practices aren't just for maintaining diversity, but maintaining relationships. Uh, Maureen, you know, my first recruiter, she kept that relationship open. She became my advocate. She became my ally. And those are the, the people out there. You know, and if, when you invest in people out there, that's what makes a difference. Another thing is uh, when I was a lead for the U.S. Department of Labor in diversity hiring at, in Washington, D.C., uh, they were wanting to hire more females. Uh, employees, like she was talking about, and their their pipeline had suddenly dropped. And it was because the person who had been maintaining those relationships as an organization, organization-wide responsibility for the entire, they had that particular mission of hiring females for the department. And that one person is the point of contact uh, maintained that. So once she was gone, uh, then there was no one there to maintain that. So you, you have to make sure that the best practices keep going. So innovation is great, but then maintaining it is really where the hard work comes in. And you really have to invest just like raising a child, you know, teach it the values, make sure you keep the conversation going, make sure you're exchanging ideas in this relationship. And, you know, that's what, to me, successful diversity practices are all about. Hello? So in Zynga. Uh, I have one question for you because I know that you are preparing to uh, work on your event. When yes. we decided to, to do this conversation, we wanted to talk about repairing a brand. One of the initiatives that you took uh, the mantle on and you ran with was engaging the LGBT audience. 
can you just share with the attendees here today the power of, of, of the impact that that had on the organization and as you all plan to move forward? Sure. I mean, we so our brand was in trouble with a couple of communities. I'd first say we were in trouble with the African American community because of the disparaging comments that our ownership made about the community, and so we certainly had to have brand equity with them because um, that was the starting point of this mess. But as your you know, as it relates to your question about LGBTQ, that's a demographic that's low hanging fruit in the city of Atlanta. We are so fortunate to live in a diverse city where um, there's a large population, but unfortunately sports teams haven't paid good attention to LGBTQ. And so when we initially wanted to get engaged with this community, we wanted to make sure it was organic. We wanted to make sure that our efforts went far beyond marching in the pride parade and doing things that could seem self-serving. And so what we did was uh, really immerse ourselves in their community and do a lot of listening and a lot of service, a lot of on-hand service instance there is a group called lost and found and lost and found is a house for boys and girls that have come out to their families and their families have decided to disown them and so we brought basketball clinics to lost and found and uh, we've had lots of sessions with youth to teach them about um, self-empowerment self-esteem and just really getting back um, into the swing of things so that they can be contributing members of society. And so when the LGBTQ community saw us serving them in ways that were not about bolstering our brand, it actually was more um, engaging for our brand and, and created equity um, because it, it seemed real and it didn't seem like something that was rainbow washing a situation, but we really wanted to know the issues and collectively figure out ways to solve them. And then another thing that we did was during... Um, the Orlando massacre at Pulse nightclub, we had a vigil at the Center for Civil and Human Rights and did not wear any Hawks branded clothing, but went there in solidarity with the community to show our support. And I think that when your your efforts are authentic and they don't seem forced and they don't seem like marketing, I think that communities that you're trying to attract will actually feel a lot more um, sensitive and, and caring about what you're trying to do and they'll be more willing to engage so that's just a brief way that we have decided to reach out to an emerging community and it's been successful so far thanks zing so sam as we close it up uh one thing that you wanted them to do uh, i'm hoping that you will share one thing that you hope that they stop doing for the remainder of 2018. well that's a hard question I would say if you do one thing every day with, with just one more unique candidate, <clears throat> you know, it's like 45 RPM every day. Sorry, excuse me. If it's 4.55 PM at the end of the day, it's five minutes to five, and you're saying, okay, I'm ready to go home. I'm tired. I, dinner's going to be ready soon, and uh, maybe I can just do one more candidate. Uh, maybe it's a person with disability. It's a woman. It's, it's some other unique candidate. Uh, just plan for that one last email every day. Just send it out. Take the two minutes to write that out to that person, and then let it go and see what happens from there. If you do that every day, just that one more thing to add, just be, then that five minutes before you go home. Now, Multiply that by 365, and I'll bet you're going to get some surprising results for your organization. So my challenge is to start now. Make that a habit. Do that one more thing before you go home. That's it. Mari, you are inside of a large organization, well-respected as well. And I'd love for you to share with them one thing that they should also stop doing from your perspective. Um, I would reiterate, again, to look look in places that are outside of your comfort zone. And the second thing I would do is say to stop looking at candidates in a silo. Look at them holistically. So let's say you have a candidate who may be an, a non-traditional student or who is working a full-time job and has internships in addition to their course load. And so maybe they have a 3.0 versus a candidate who has a 3.7 but doesn't have any of those additional responsibilities or extracurriculars. 
what does that tell you about the student who's doing three things versus a student who is doing just one? And what would that mean for your organization to have someone who is able to capably and, and to perform well doing three or four things at a time versus having one person that just does one? What, what, what could that mean for your organization if they add value in different ways and multiple, multiple disciplines? So look at candidates holistically as opposed to just looking at them through one core lens. And so for me, as we close out, the one thing that I would ask that you do is we stop becoming distracted. Stay focused. You don't have to do it all. We don't have to be best. You don't have to be best in class. I just need you to stay focused, stay attentive. Too many individuals are finding themselves moving after the shiny ball, if you will. If you don't believe me, think about the conversation right now. We're arguing over inclusion and diversity. Like we really are trying to change the narrative around the framing of this work. People are spending time and money on trying to put the word inclusion before diversity. And I submit to you that if we allow ourselves to get distracted by something as small as that, we'll spend the next five or 10 years chasing that shiny ball and we'll still not necessarily make any progress. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, period. You can call it whatever you want, but we gotta do this work. You have to be different. You have to want to be different. So I leave you with bad will be the day for any man or woman when they become absolutely contented with the thoughts that they are thinking, the deeds that they are doing, with the life that they are living, when forever beating at the doors of their soul is some great desire to do something more, to live more, to be more, to recruit more, because after all, you are a child of the Most High.